Good morning, welcome back this Thursday morning to Grace for today. Douglas, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I am fine. Thank good. You. Um, well, I'm excited, good. as I always am in these mornings, yes, because yes. not only are we in each other's company, which is a great mm. thing, but we are opening the Word of God, studying what He would say to us, and really just filling our hearts for the day that's ahead with one of these thoughts for the day. And we are in Cafe Refresh here in Kosai. It's a great cup of coffee. I always like to plug the cafe here. Come down uh, and buy yourself a cup of coffee. The staff here would just be delighted to, uh, to wait on you. And uh, we know that we can get a, a decent cup of coffee yes, during the yes, day, Douglas, don't we? Yes. Uh, well, we started on Monday in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Mm. And we're looking at these eight great promises uh, that come from eight characteristics or traits that are found in the Christian. Mm -hmm. Now the Sermon on the Mount is a three chapter long sermon that we find in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. And there Jesus brings his first sermon and arguably his greatest sermon, a sermon that has touched so many lives it led to the likes of Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching through uh, that, the Sermon on the Mount, and his preaching uh, resulted in other people being transformed, you know, the truth of God being uh, expounded in that way. But we are concentrating on the first section in the Beatitudes. And uh, these eight promises, as I say, have got so much to teach us. But let's read the next one, which we find in Matthew chapter 5, and it's verse 4. So please turn with me. Hopefully our technical people here will be able to get the verse to come up on the screen. But Matthew 5 verse 4, the second Beatitude says this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I think this is just such an appropriate uh, thing to discuss this morning because we know that there are people who have heavy hearts, people who are mourning, but this isn't a, an earthly mourning. This isn't a mourning over perhaps a sadness that comes in, whether it's a bereavement or whether it's failure or whether it's uh, disappointment. This is uh, not that type of mourning. That's a misunderstanding that we find about this beatitude, that Christians should be sad all the time. The more sad you are, the more blessed you will become. And uh, we certainly know that there's a lot of joy to be had yes. in being a Christian, a lot of fun that we can have with each other, but a lot of, of really deep and serious and joy that is of, of a grave and gravitas nature uh, that we find in worshipping God together. But this is a type of mourning that is actually a deep sorrow over sin. Blessed are those who mourn. They are mourning over sin. Uh, they are finding a sorrow in their very soul over the sin that is part of them, the sins that they have committed, the offence that they have caused uh, to an almighty God. And we are finding this morning, here is something that is a prerequisite for salvation. You need to mourn over sin in order to be saved. Those who are blasé mm -hmm. about sin, well, you know, are they really going to care whether they sin or not? They probably would pursue it. The more that they would enjoy something that is wrong before God and pursue it, you know, there's no mourning over that, but an alacrity, a, a, a gleefulness to go and do these things that God so hates. And uh, this mourning against sin is actually an unrest in the soul over the very thing that God despises above all other things. And... Um, the disquiet of the soul is caused by there being sin there and a desire that the sin would be taken away, dealt with. But of course we have this promise that says if you're mourning over sin, if you're a mourner, then you're going to be comforted. We know that when we sin we offend God and that should rightly give us a fear. And so often preachers would say, well, that's a type of fear of reverence. Now I think we need a terror of the Lord. Because we're talking about holy God, Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy. We're talking about God who is got eyes that are too pure to look upon iniquity, that's Habakkuk. Mm. Uh, we're talking about a God who actually is going to punish sin by pouring out all of his wrath on it. And so sin is not a light matter, it's not a jovial thing, it's not a jocular uh, issue in our lives. But the person who realises that is somebody who will be comforted. Because they will come to God looking for forgiveness. They will come to God, yes, they will have a remorse. And of course, remorse is that regret. But they will have a repentance. And repentance goes so much further than, than mere remorse. Because repentance actually says, I'm going to turn away from this thing. I'm going to turn towards God. So 180 degree turn. Away from sin to Christ. And when somebody has that mourning, they are blessed because they know they have forgiveness. 
And if we know we're sinners this morning, let me read to you Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2, because here is a comfort for us. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, oh comfort my people, it says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. When we mourn over sin, God comforts us, he forgives us. And this very much this morning draws us to talk about salvation. And these thoughts for the day, we're, we're finding are, are, are centering not on necessarily the, the deep doctrinal matters. We'll get there. But we have to start off with the very fundamental matter of salvation. If there's no salvation in your life, it doesn't matter if you can explain even the deepest of all theological um, matters. And, and so I need to challenge every one of us this morning. Do we have a sorrow over sin? Or does it just kind of wash over us? Is it water off a duck's back? Is it irrelevant in our lives? We have to have that mourning that is deep. It's grievous. It's lamentable. And it really has to grip us that we are so, so upset over our sin. That our soul actually can't find a place to lie down and be comfortable uh, we perhaps are in a spiritual sense pacing the room in disquiet and it's when that happens we know that God's comfort is there because we have to throw ourselves on the mercy of Christ and he will never uh, turn us away and that then goes back to the beatitude before mm-hmm. that we right. yep. in humility and poverty of spirit rely mm. upon Christ and so this morning have you addressed your sin before a holy and almighty God like this have you come to Christ well, the forgiveness that only he can give for the sin uh, that disrupts, damages, and really uh, contorts our relationship with a, a, an almighty and holy God. And that's the second beatitude, Douglas. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you've got any kind of questions that spring to mind or you would like to ask. Well, is this not at odds with the New Testament teaching of being filled with joy? Do you think of Philippians there? Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. <laughs> yes, I hope. Um, well, I think we have to start from the perspective that the Bible is inerrant, it is infallible, there are no contradictions in it. So if the Bible's telling us mm-hmm. that we need to lament over sin, as we have to do here, but we have to rejoice, we have to find the explanation um, that is kind of going to bring these two concepts together. Um, the truth is this, that... Yes, we are to be a people of joy, but we will never become that people of joy unless we've lamented over sin. Mm. We're never going to find that there's that lightness in our spirit before God unless we have, with a great weight upon us, dealt with the wrong that we have committed before a holy God. Paul helps us in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 where he says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And what Paul is telling us there, that if we truly repent before God, he will take away his wrath. He will take away the stain of sin. He will take away the guilt of sin. He will take away the regret that we have over sin because he deals with it and he deals with it eternally. The world doesn't have that assurance. When the world does something Mm. wrong, it's, it's, it's entirely and utterly dealt with. So this morning, if you've genuinely repented over sin, you are comforted and have that comfort that your sin has been taken and has been placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that great exchange takes place at Calvary. He takes your sin and you receive his righteousness. And what an amazing and wonderful saviour we have that would save us in such a way, at such a cost, and for such a long time because that salvation is for eternity. Where are you on this matter this morning? Have you mourned over your sin? And do you know the comfort that comes um, from being forgiven? Well, that's all we've got time for, Douglas. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your for question. Me. I think yeah. hopefully that's uh, <laughs> given a, a, a wee answer there. I trust it's been profitable this morning just to creep up on this second beatitude and see what it would uh, say to us. It's important we start the day together in yeah. God's word yeah. so do mourn over sin but know the comfort that comes from Christ Jesus and all that remains is for me to wish you a blessed day and we pray for uh, your prophet in the Lord Jesus Christ
Bye-bye for now. Bye.